Warning, this program will discuss adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. very happy uh, to introduce our next speaker. Uh, I met Sister Sheila when, when uh, I was in high school. Uh, just going to stop a rumor before it starts. We did not go to the prom together. <laughs> Although I would have been honored to. <laughs> sister Sheila Galligan is a sister, the a sister servant of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Uh, their mother house is in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia in a, in a, a town called Immaculata. And uh, she has been a professor in the Department of Theology at Immaculata University since 1990, uh, where she teaches many of the elective and special topics courses. She's also taught courses at the Pontifical College Josephinum and at St. Charles Borromeo Seminary in Philadelphia. She's delved deeply into the lives and literary legacies of C.S. Lewis and St. John Paul II. And she's actively engaged in promoting respect for human life and has served in the Archdiocese and Pastoral Council of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. She's going to speak to us today on forgiveness, the name of love in a wounded world. So please welcome Sister Sheila. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, sometimes when I get up in the morning... Uh, especially during the school year, I say, good God, morning. But this morning I said, good morning, God. (laughs) Because I knew I was going to be here uh, after lunch trying to wake you up (laughs) and uh, most of all, hopefully be uh, God's instrument. Uh, Teresa uh, of Calcutta, she used to say that she thought she was a Uh, She wanted to be. She asked God for the grace to be a pencil in his hand. How many know that phrase? A pencil in his hand. So I hope that I'm a pencil in his hand, or because it's after lunch, maybe a highlighter (laughs) in his hand. So uh, thank you. Um, Because I'm basically a teacher, I've provided a handout. If you didn't get that, maybe you could raise your hand, and I think there's a couple, they're back on the chairs, some extras. And then I have the PowerPoint just to keep us alive. I know that there's the phrase out there, death by PowerPoint, and we don't want that either. So uh, it's a combination of medieval technology, that's me, in person, and uh, the PowerPoint and the handout. All right, and before plunging into this topic, um, we should begin with a prayer. So at the bottom of the handout, on the side that says, Forgiveness, the name of love in a wounded world, there is a reflection from St. Paul and his letter to the Corinthians. So we'll just begin with that so that we can place ourselves in God's gracious presence Be still and ask for the Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds and enkindle our hearts to practice, to do the truth in love. So, we reflect with St. Paul. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if one has a grievance against another. As the Lord has forgiven you, so must you also do. And over all these put on love, that is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of Christ control your hearts, the peace into which you were also called in one body, And be thankful. And since today is the feast of St. Alphonsus of Liguri, um, my own community is Redemptorist. So this is our major community feast day. Uh, Right now in Philadelphia, about 800 sisters are gathering, and we have our convocation today because it's the feast of St. Alphonsus. Redemptive spirituality, perfect for today. 
in God's providence, I thought, to be here. And so adding to St. Paul, um, one of the phrases, the text from the Psalms, we say to the Lord, for with you is forgiveness and the fullness of redemption. For this, O God, we revere you. So we should all become psalmified <laughs> and get the psalms into our heads. But at least we start with, um, with that, Psalm 130. Okay, a couple minutes. Um, my own background, Father, thank you for the gracious in- introduction. Um, my background was Army. I went to public schools most of my life. So lived all over the world, met diverse groups of peoples, um, cuisine, <laughs> living situations, etc. And when I entered the community, I was very blessed. I taught first grade for 10 years. <laughs> and that's my claim to fame, all right? Uh, ten, first graders are just, just so marvelous. And I had eighth grade for one year, uh, went away to study a little, and then came back and taught high school for five years. That's my ticket to heaven. (laughs) Uh, And then uh, since then, I've been at uh, Immaculata University and uh, for the past uh, 24 years. So um, many of those young people are first graders with bigger bodies. (laughs) So God is good. And I'm very happy to have had that, um, that great blessing in my life. All right. And then in light of our topic, you know, we're all in this together. And I'm sure that you know that for most people who write books or give talks, the topic that they're speaking about is usually the one that causes them the most difficulty <laughs> or is a challenge. So, uh, yes, I might be able to give a good talk, but we're all in this together. Yes? yes? We're all in this together. So I come from a family that has its own situations. I live, I live with 44 brides of Christ. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> and of course, there's the uh, realm of academia and uh, being with people who all have PhDs and... Uh, I won't continue on that. All right. So we're all in this together. All right. Amen. And then last thing before we get serious and in, into this topic itself, uh, because of teaching children, and many of the children are Thomas Aquinas's little Augustines, just ready to bloom. And they have a great wisdom. And so from letters of children to God can situate us, right? The context. And one little girl wrote to God, Dear God, I don't know how you can love everyone in the whole wide world. There are only four people in my family, and I can't do it. (laughs) (laughs) And, And the second... The second is little Jennifer, and she says, Dear God, if I come back as someone else, don't let me be Jennifer Horton because I hate her. (laughs) (laughs) And the third, the third, this roots us in the great truth. At the end of each day, we're like little Frank, and he says, Praise, dear God, I'm doing the best I can. (laughs) All right, so there we are, and now I'll move into the serious business here. Uh, I'm going to begin with uh, the the title, of course, and why I chose that, and then describe a little bit, but I'm with a group that thoroughly understands uh, the situation that we're in, so sin and sinfulness, And then bring in God and our God, especially in light of Jesus Christ. And then hopefully, um, all of that probably would be review for you. And then many of you have been to forgiveness talks and read articles and 
you're into knowing that you have to get connected with the world of forgiveness. How many agree? Yes, you're. But then I'd hope that I would give you some new insights that are linked with forgiveness vocabulary. Right? We're the people of the word. And what's the vocabulary that we're using in light of forgiveness, especially the word mercy? And then finally, hopefully, get to some practical ways to exercise forgiveness. Because most of us, we agree, yes, this is a great good, but then (laughs) on a practical level, how do I go about it? Does that resonate with you? Right? So I I, I hope, hope, (laughs) that virtue of hope, something practical to go on for, for your lives. I am not here as a psychologist or a counselor I don't get involved with with that, those situations. So I'm here to speak the truth about what we would believe as Catholic Christians and then a little bit about how we would live that out. So we're good to go? Good. Boy, you're better than my classes after one. (laughs) That's for sure. Okay. So um, we begin with my title here, uh, Forgiveness, the Name of Love in a Wounded World. Difficult to get a good title I find that that's the best. I've given forgiveness talks that are called Forgiveness, the Best Revenge. (laughs) That's good. And it is, it is, if we understand it correctly. Forgiveness, the bridge, the bridge to wholeness and healing. The bridge to wholeness and healing. Forgiveness, uh, grace and gift. Could go on and on and on. I love this title the most. It comes from the writings of Henry Nouwen, all right? And he said that forgiveness is the name of love practiced among people who love poorly. I'll say that again. Forgiveness is the name of love practiced among people who love poorly. The hard truth is that all people love poorly. Just another way of saying sin. We sin, right? We need to forgive and be forgiven every day, every hour, increasingly. That is the great work of love among the fellowship of the weak. Isn't that good? The fellowship of the weak in the human family. All right, so that's why I chose that title um, and some of the imagery that goes there. So moving right into the heart of the matter and a little bit at the top of the handout, um, the, what's our situation? I begin with, with the situation. And our situation is sin. That's the situation, all right? That there is this matter called sin. Our culture's allergic to the word, <laughs> all right? The only place I've seen it used was in a restaurant, and it was about eating sinfully delicious chocolate cake. (laughs) But otherwise, we can't call things a sin. We can't name it. And we need to reclaim. My classes, I make them say, sin, sin, sin. (laughs) But we get into this a little bit. But um, what's the heart of the matter? That we, what is sin? Uh, The German, our word comes from the German, so I like etymology, And the etymology is from sunde, to sunder, to sever, to cut off. So we're cut off. We're severed from the heart of our existence, my being. I'm created for love, by love, to love, out of love. And sin messes that up. So I'm cut off, cut off, severed from. Therefore, there's death. There's ruptured relationships. All right, so the best definitions is, definition is a broken relationship. We break relationship. And because we're going against the nature God has created us to be, we're out of order. I, I like that. Breaking relationship and out of order. Those are good ways. There's many. But those are good ways to look at what is sin. So if... I am out of order. I'll just use Father Phil. <laughs> All right. That if something happened, 
and we're, we're out of relationship. There is some kind of a, um, a sinfulness that is, has been at work. He hurt my feelings deeply. <laughs> All right. Then the relationship is out of, out of order. I can't, I can't face him, look him eye to eye, and my own life. All right. I get into, I call it the state of unforgiveness, and the geography of the heart is filled, my heart is filled with, I, they're all R words. That's the fruit of teaching first grade. <laughs> all right? They're R. So I, I feel resentment, a ruptured relationship. I feel resentment, rumination, the desire for retaliation. That's when I go ballistic, <laughs> right? Retaliation is hot anger. Revenge is I'll get him later. I'll smile now. Yes, everybody's with me, right? Um, the, the inside is uh, smoldering hatred, hostility, rancor. That's a, no, a good word, too. All right, rancor. I love that word, rancor. Right? And then we move into being, that's why the disruptive relationship affects others. If something happened here, and, I'm, and we've been good friends for years, and I go back and face the sisters, and I'm off kilter, out of sync with Father Bachansky because of whatever happened, then when I get home, I'm nasty with the sisters. Not that they did anything wrong, but then I become a little porcupine. (laughs) So we know what it's like, yes? So that's the situation. It's toxic. And God came, redemption, to rescue us from this because The state of unforgiveness holds us prisoner, and it hurts us deeply, hurts us, all right? While I'm with this, because of um, the fact that for most of us, the situations are more home-based, family, people that I'm with, then my immediate reaction is um, a mix of anger, and I think specifically the group here can relate, Anger and sadness, both. There can be situations that I'm not real close to somebody and I'm just plain angry. And so I'm thinking, you know, I'd like to rearrange your face. (laughs) (laughs) Now. (laughs) Just plain angry. But (laughs) because I'm not close to you, I'm not sad. But when it's a deep hurt with somebody that I love... It's a, it's a mixture. So I've coined a new word, smadness. <laughs> There's smadness. All right, how do you feel? Try that with somebody someday when they say, how are you? And say, smad. <laughs> and see what happens, right? Okay, so then God comes to move on to the positive because I could go on and on, as you can tell. <laughs> the positive is that God comes in with God's, with his grace and with the face of, of Jesus um, and calls us out of that, asks us to release that, the toxin, to open up our minds and our hearts, to let him in and begin to actualize love in our lives. What is love? And love is Thomas Aquinas, who wrote volumes, but in one little verse, one line, what is love? Christian love. The effective willing of the good of the other. So I'm in a state of smadness. And I'm thinking about myself and how hurt I am. But love is going to be the effective willing of the good of the other. So that's the one who hurt me. You following? And it's the effective. It means I have to act in some way. Not just think about it, but effect it. The effecting, effective willing of the good of the other. Which in our wounded world, in which we all get a hundred in sin... Each of us gets an A in the course. All right, 
then this kind of loving is always going to be difficult. Forgiveness will never be easy. Even if it's something, it, in the light of eternity, a $5 wound. Right? A $500 wound. No matter what, it's not easy to effectively will the good of the other. The other. I love G.K. Chesterton. He says, not only are we in the same boat, but we are all seasick. <laughs> all right, so that's a, there's lots of ways to express it, yet. And Pope Francis speaks of the field hospital. So it's just good to get yourselves good little um, references of, you know, what, what are we about here? What's happening? So the effective willing of the good of the other for us <laughs> is expressed in and through God's call to be what? Holy. Oh, let's say that with some oomph. To be holy, right? God says, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Holy. So holiness is what we are about. That's what we're called to. What is holiness in the Old Testament? When, when God says, be holy, for I, the Lord, am holy. Holy in the Hebrew, kadosh. All right, kadosh. And it means, maybe some of you already know. Good. See, set apart. It means set apart. It means different. It means different. And therefore, if we're holy, we're going to be different. All right? It's different if you say, I exercise chastity. Oh, that's different. <laughs> it's... Uh, yes? And you're set apart. You're set apart. You're set apart. But this is a good thing. This is a, you know, if you're honest today and you don't cheat, the cheating culture, that's different. You know, this is truly your work. That's different. <laughs> so next time at Mass, if you don't sing the Holy Holy, say different, different, different. <laughs> or, that will wake up everyone around you, right? <laughs> So holiness is a difference, a difference that is good. And that kind of holiness is compelling. All right, it compels attention. And of all the ways of expressing the effective willing of the good of the other, forgiveness is at the heart of the matter. And so forgiveness compels the world's attention. They might not approve of Christians and God, but forgiveness just happened with Charleston. Right? Um, next to um, near Immaculata University, uh, now about eight years ago, the Amish. All right, on the news, it wasn't about the killing. We're used to that. It was forgiveness. And so this difference, this holiness matters. Uh, Flannery O'Connor, great writer, she said, the truth will make you odd, O-D-D. <laughs> the truth will make you different. So that's the key, all right, uh, idea that is at work. And then our, this difference is for Christians. The holiness is crystallized in Jesus Christ, all right, who is God, the Holy One of Israel, uh, in the flesh, in the flesh. So John Paul II, um, one of my good friends in heaven, uh, I don't know if I should say this in public because I know it'll go viral, but everybody knows who I live with. Because I've lived with all these women all my life, I've asked the Lord God, when I get to heaven, if I get there, I want my mansion to be all men for a little while. <laughs> John Paul II is there waiting for me with a Guinness. Now, here. So Jesus reveals the face of the Father's mercy. So holiness is going to be met or in, crystallized in, in mercy. 
Pope Francis, wherever the church is present, because we're God's children, we're called to, to manifest this, wherever there are Christians, everyone should find an oasis of mercy. And you've got the water image there, the cleansing, cleanse out my heart, an oasis of mercy. Right? St. Francis himself said, let no one approach you without meeting the eyes of the mercy. eyes of mercy. So mercy is going to be at the heart of everything. And right, I, I know I made you laugh, but I have a purpose. <laughs> right. uh, my students on evaluations, they'll say, she smiles and laughs a lot, but write down every word she says. <laughs> <laughs> So here we are. So holy, Old Testament, Leviticus, be holy for I, the Lord, am holy. And then Jesus rephrases it. So if there's one text from the New Testament that expresses the heart of it all, redemption, salvation, healing, discipleship, it's be merciful as your heavenly Father is Merciful. So that's why we have to get to know the, the Father. All right. How does it all work out in a clear way? We believe we're created in the image and likeness of God. We're baptized and we're sanctified. Therefore, the, the kernel of the holiness is there. Yes? But then we must respond to grace and we're enabled to effectively will the good of the other, and oh, you are good, and act, act as children of God. So here, an ancient Hebrew um, little aphorism, uh, axiom, makes good sense. And he said, whenever a person approaches you because you're made in the image and likeness of God, and think of the one who wounded you, all right? Who do you consider enemy or frenemy, <laughs> right? And the, the saying says, whenever they come near you, and every human person, everyone, when you look at them, imagine they're surrounded by angels, and the angels are saying, make way, make way, make way, make way for the image and likeness of God. Now think of some of the people that irritate and annoy. <laughs> and you have to say, make way, make way, make way. Now if we all did that, wouldn't the world be better? Yeah, because it would, you'd hesitate then in some of the ugliness that's inside. All right, so... Um, we want to move along on that. And then, okay, Jesus is the face of the Father. How is the Father imaged for our tradition? My students have to memorize this. <laughs> right? And we say it every class. Because if we're to be merciful as the Heavenly Father, what's at work with the Heavenly Father? And our Heavenly Father says, the Old Testament, revealed himself as, you know this, the Lord, the Lord, what? Merciful and gracious, slow to anger, not, not angry, but slow, and rich in what? Kindness and fidelity, continuing kindness for a thousand generations, and forgiving wickedness, crime, and sin, yet not declaring the guilty, guilty. So we have... Love our God's, um, the, the heart of God, the primary attribute of our God is mercy. That's his primary attribute. Therefore, as his children, that's why St. Francis said, no one should approach us without meeting the eyes of mercy, because I am to be like this. So this is a good reflection for you tonight. You know, can you put your name in? And I'll put mine. Sheila, Sheila, merciful and gracious, slow to anger. I already blew it. No. <laughs> Rich in kindness and fidelity. Well, I'm kind, but, you know, what about that nun that never said thank you yet for all those 4 o'clock a.m. trips to the airport? <laughs> right? 
my kindness will only go so far. <laughs> so this is a good, good reflection indeed, because we should be able to, to put our name in. So this is our God, and we could do a lot with kindness and fidelity. Okay? And then this God is manifested. I said we do God, right? The situation, and now we're into God. All right, manifested, expressed most, um, a masterpiece, Luke 15, which we know the story, so I'm not going to review that. But within it, it's the verbs that tell the tale. And within that masterpiece, that text, God's great gift, imaging the Father, the Father holding out readiness to forgive, the verbs, what is love? Effective willing, verbs. Love is, God is a verb, not a noun. The English scholars will get me, but what does the father do? The father sees, so the eyes, how do I see the other? Had compassion. And the Greek means guts are moved. You know, visceral, highly visceral. And what? Ran, ran out. So a humiliating act for someone in that country. Ran. Fell upon his neck, hugged, the embrace, the circling, and what? And kissed. Five verbs. For, for the people of that day, that's a reminder of the Torah, the law, the five books. Are you with me? Right? Like we miss that kind of thing. But this is, this is the heart of the matter. And we are called to act like that. Okay? So now we get to, and it's on here as well as on your paper. Okay? I, um, it's in the middle of the handout. So if we're called to exercise mercy... Because we are following the command, be merciful like the Father. All right, always ready to offer the gift, even if the other person's not willing to receive it. Because right, that's, that's where it usually is the situation. The other person is not ready to receive it. How many know what I'm talking about? Right? They'll, they'll say, I didn't do anything wrong, you're the one, or there's no ability even to communicate with them. Right? So Christian forgiveness says, all right, I can't control the other person. But myself, I can always be ready to grant, to give the gift all right, of mercy, of forgiveness. So what about this word? And hopefully this would be something new. Are you all all right? Yes. Need to stand up? And we only have a half hour to go. <laughs> all right, okay. So the root, uh, the, the etymology of mercy. Are you okay on roots? You have to say yes anyway. <laughs> all right, so this goes back. It's John Paul II, and it's from his famous footnote, um, footnote 52 in his document, Dives in Misericordia. Someday if things are, there's no conversation, you can say, do you know what famous footnote 52 is? In do- <laughs> and really impress people. <laughs> so in this, he develops the roots of the word mercy. And in Hebrew, the word for mercy is linked with R-H-M. That's, that's the root. And all of their vocabulary comes from roots. And their word for womb is rehem, R-E-H-E-M. So you have the R-H-M. Mercy is rahamim, got R-H-M. Therefore, mercy and forgiveness is womb-like love. It's like the love that is linked with a mother's womb. Please, everybody look at me. I am not saying God is a a woman. I'll repeat that. I am not getting into that. This is imagery that's linked with linguistics that speaks a great truth. Okay, so this love 
is womb-like love. That's the Hebrew. The Greek, one of the Greek words is eleos, and we'd say kyrie eleison, like a, a liaison, a binding, a salve, bonding. And of course, the Latin, so beautiful, misericordia, a sad heart. So we have sad hearts about sin, and so does God. A sad hearts about injustice. Misericordia, beautiful, beautiful vocabulary word that is at work. And then, because of that, how does this work itself out? That imagery, why does it make good sense? Now, when, when you're exercising, and it is exercise, right? Virtue is always exercise. Then remember, I'm exercising womb-like love. Why? Because first, the womb is the place of sacrificial love. The womb is linked with sacra facio, to make holy. Sacrificial love, physical, emotional, exercise of the effective willing of the good of the other, of the child that's in that womb. Yes? All right, it's the effective, it's the place of sacrificial love. And forgiveness is costly. It is hard. So that's, that's are you getting it? Right? The next is aspect is that the womb would symbolize, be linked with, place of relationship. The life that's in the womb comes from, or should come from, relationship. And then the child is in relationship to that mother. So it's the place linked with relationship. Forgiveness, the heart of the matter is that it's linked with relationships. Broken relationships, relationships that need healing. But it's about relationship. And then, oh, oh, sorry, I should go back there, huh? Uh, The womb, this is difficult when I deal with the uh, nuances of the, um, the semantics of this. In our culture today, we don't have the understanding But for the Hebrew people, when a woman was pregnant, that sign of new life, that new child was gift. So the the womb, the womb welcomed the new life. New life came into the being of the person in a welcoming way. Today, no. Right? There's an anti-life, hostility toward life in the womb. And pregnancy is even called a disease. So this is difficult to to jump back to. The child was welcome. And for us, in forgiveness, when we're in the state of unforgiveness, at least in the beginning, the person is not really welcome within. Because when we look within and we think of the person, we think negatively. We think, They did this. How could this have happened? How could they have done this to me? I was so good. Are you with me? Right? We're like Steven Spielbergs. And the person is a prisoner in there, free rent space, and not really welcome. And then because of it, we seem to have, I already kind of referred to it, and Pope Francis does too. If you're in a state of unforgiveness, it shows on your being. You're like vinegar. You're not a joy-filled Christian. And you might as well have, I just found out that there really is one of these for sale. And it's a a mat, so it should be a welcome mat, but the mat is black and white, white background, and the letters on it say, go away. (laughs) Do you believe that? But some of us have that outside our, (laughs) our being when we're in the state of unforgiveness. So this moves us into come well. The, the, new, the person now, if we forgive, when we think of them, they come welcomed. 
And that's a major jump. You agree? That's a, that's a major jump. Okay. Uh, I, and now I wish the other well. Um, with that, it'd be neat. Next talk, instead of somebody, oh, I love Lord of the Rings, but you could get someone on Les Mis. <laughs> right? Because the bishop, what's his name in Les Mis? Bishop Bienvenue. It's French for welcome. His name was Bishop Welcome. And he welcomed, well, we, I better not get off on that. And I'm, I'm certainly not going to sing to a bore you. But. Okay, so forgiveness um, is linked with all of those uh, ideas. I have it there in the middle of your paper. Okay, and then how do we manifest this in our lives? It's manifested either in compassion. I suffer for and with another. I suffer for them. And that's linked with forgiveness. I suffer for the other. So I pray for them. I fast for them. I make a place when it's inconvenient for them. So compassion. And then, of course, um, the, the issue of sin, of sin. I suffer for and with. So um, forgiveness is manifested in the, I mean, mercy is for, manifested in mercy and, sorry, you'll think I had a Guinness at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start that again. Mercy, mercy is manifested in forgiveness linked with sin and acts of compassion. Mercy with its boots on. Isn't that a neat phrase? Mercy with its boots on, that kind of idea. Okay? So finally we come to, and then we'll get into some of the, of the more practical. And I have this definition on your paper because I found that it's the best for what is at work. Um, Friends, we have a 42-hour, three-credit course on this at Immaculata. So I'm trying to do it in an hour and 15 minutes, 42 hours. So there's a lot in between, a lot um, that, that's, I have to jump. I have to jump here a lot. So the, the best definition, which needs good analysis, but I love this definition. Forgiveness, and it's a gift. You know, always, that's why we're, we're ready to give the gift to the other, is a willingness to abandon, that means I let go, of my right to resentment, negative judgment, and indifferent behavior toward one who has unjustly injured us. So, because it's in our DNA for justice and rightness, and the one who's hurt us is a threat to that, to my well-being. You with me? Right, so anger, a righteous anger, and I let go the resentment, the negative judgment, while that's where my practical, hopefully, will come in, right? While fostering, beautiful vocabulary, to foster, to nourish, to cultivate the undeserved qualities of compassion, generosity, and even love toward him or her. Because all definitions simplify complex matters. And there are situations where, yes, I believe in the God who calls me to be holy. Jesus, I want to be like that. I want to forgive. But because of what's happened, the first little step, C.S. Lewis, one of my boyfriends in heaven, <laughs> right? C.S. Lewis said, you know, that we journey um, yielding by inches. Yielding by inches. And for so many of us, the first step might even be that I have to pray for the desire to forgive or the desire to desire to forgive or the desire to desire to desire to <laughs> forgive. You know, and God knows where you are. God knows that. God knows that. And then, then we inch along towards the fostering, reframing, so that I can see the other in a new light, okay? So we want to get rid of this geography of the heart, and we want to take care of, in our reframing, two more little items, and then we'll do the practical. That'll wake you up a little bit. Yes? <laughs> You're sure you're all right? Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, what basically keeps on 
uh, as C.S. Lewis says, bobbing its head up all the time. <laughs> so I, I think, oh my goodness, I have forgiven. I wish this other person well. Um, uh, they might not even be responding, but I know that I have inner peace now. Things are good. And then all of a sudden, there's a song that plays on the radio that all the memories come up, or an image, or a television show, or we used to make popcorn together, and now they're making popcorn, and it comes back again. How many experienced it? Right? You think you've moved along, and then it comes up again. So the two um, arenas that are issues, matters of the heart, that fuel, they're like snowball, tsunami effect all the time, are rumination and resentment. So rumination, we think about it all the time, like that cow, that's where it comes from, the cow and rumination, and thinking, 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 and every time we think, as first graders used to say, you make it more worser. <laughs> and you remember the moment. Um, but seriously, no, we, we do. How many, I shouldn't keep asking that, but we know. This is the best poem I ever found about it, about rumination. I chew. I chew about this. I chew about that. I chew about them. All that chewing, I'm still not satisfied. I'm still not full. I chew some more. I chew about what they do. I chew about what they don't do. I masticate. In the end, I discover I have eaten away the best part of my life. It's, it's very good. Wow. Words of wisdom. And it is exactly what we do in our minds when there's an issue. And then the thinking... It's the thinking that provokes the feelings. I have to change my thinking in order to change the feelings. But the thinking fuels resentment. And resentment is I start to feel all over again that jumble of emotions and get back to, Lord, help me to desire, to desire, to forgive again <laughs> in, in, on the practical every, every day issue, Okay. So we need to decide to forgive. The decisional element, I have that there somewhere on the paper. That's one issue. But the emotional issue, the emotions, that's what takes you know, the journey from the head to the heart. That can be the lifetime issue, the feeling-centered elements that are at work with all of this. So I have to replace the negative with positive Slowly, slowly, slowly. And in light of that, um, I have found the very best thing, uh, at least it's helped in my life, so a practical, comes from the whole richly suggestive teaching of the church rooted in scripture about blessing. And we believe that we are blessed B-L-E-S-T, favored, attitude of gratitude. We are God's beloved. We're loved into being. And we're on the way to being blessed. <laughs> I don't know if you get that. Right, so if one of you died today and everyone here said, oh my gosh, they're a saint, let's, let's notify Rome immediately. <laughs> right? What's the first oh, big title you'd get? Blessed. Blessedness means you've heard God's word and put it into practice. So when we all die, we should expect, we should hope that the Lord will say, welcome, my blessed, my beloved, and my blessed Sheila. <laughs> but right now, every day, God looks down and he says, okay, little Sheila, <laughs> inching along, you are ever my blessed and my beloved on the way to being blessed. More blessed some days than others, <laughs> right? So blessing, all right? And Peter, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with what? Blessing, so that you may inherit a 
a blessing. So if you turn your paper over, and I have on the back the tools for forgiveness, and this is rooted in um, the scripture that makes Christianity really different from psychotherapeutic forgiveness, which is to forgive for my own good, but I'm forgiving for the good of the, of the other. All right, so Jesus says in several places, do good to those who hate you, do those who've hurt you, bless, bless, there it is, those who curse you, pray for those who maltreat you, love your enemy and do good. What is love? The effective willing of the good of the other. What do I wish for this other that has hurt me? I wish for their spiritual, physical, emotional good. That's why I'm so hurt. If it's someone close to me, a family member, and they're isolated from the family. That's not how it ought to be. It's out of out of order, out of order. I want their good, which then will be my good. But I want their good. I want God's forgiveness to descend on them. I want them to accept the gift of mercy. All right? Here's the, I am blessed, beloved, and called to be a blessing and become blessed. So along with becoming blessed, trying to hear God's word every day and put it into practice, we will be a blessing, all right? Be a blessing. So here I'm going to invite you. Um, uh, you can use uh, any kind of a, a, ro- a rosary, beads of any kind. My students, in light of being a blessing and blessing the other, we make a forgiveness chaplet. Now, friends, I made 90 of them. That's all I could manage to come here. (laughs) All right? Um, So they're all in a box. All right? Um, I I, I make these out of cord. It's a fisherman's knot. And the students make them in our class. Because if you've made your own, we're embodied creatures. And some of their knots are bumpy and wobbly. (laughs) Some of them can only make five beads. Uh, But I say, no, that's your life, right? And at the end is a cross. All right, and we want wholeness, the circle. Right. So there's a lot involved symbolism, okay? Um, So I just had a big presentation, and I would made a 100 of them and gave them all away. So every time I I, I had a minute, I was trying to make make one for all of you. But there's only 90, so I'll put them out there and don't fight when you get out. (laughs) I'll put them downstairs near the Magnificat. But you can use anything, all right? Um, This is why the sisters say, oh, that's Sheila. She's always tied up in knots. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, um, with this, friends, I would invite you. So hopefully this would be practical, you know, that you would use the great rooted in the tradition I keep thinking I have to talk into that, but I don't. (laughs) Um, The tradition. Uh, Going back to Numbers, chapter 6, in the Old Testament, is the Aaronic blessing, right? the great blessing. So I love to be rooted in the tradition. I believe in classical prayer. We should all be able to pray the Save Regina, (laughs) including my college students. (laughs) We should, there should be things in our minds that we've memorized, that are part of the tradition, all right? And then praying the Psalms. Jesus prayed the Psalms. We're rooted in the tradition. Reclaim the framework of the classic sin, classic Coke, the seven caps, right? We've got to get back to the tradition, which roots us so beautifully. So this does, this prayer. Gazillions of people prayed it. May the Lord what? Bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace. And the suggestion is that you pray this, but pray it with great understanding for the persons that you care about, the persons that you have um, 
that you need to forgive, that need to forgive you, whatever, that you pray that God will bless them. All right, within that, oh, this is the exercise. I'll take a minute. Um, When you pray this, okay, I have to do it quickly. May the Lord, it's three times the Lord, which biblically signifies it's, this is God power. All right? Instead of praying, which is a good prayer, all right, I have a niece that does not connect with the family. So when I, I pray for her, I need, I can say, oh Lord, please help, I won't say her name, um, recognize what she's done to hurt the family. Please, Lord, may we be kind and compassionate. Lord, let her see her ways. May she see a counselor. And I pray like that. How many do? For the other. You want their good. But this is letting go of that because we come to a point in time where only God power can be at work. And so this is a movement, and it works for the other person's good as well as your own, to ask God, place them in God's hand. May the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Who's that Lord? Merciful and gracious, slow to and three times, God power. May the Lord bless you. And biblically, to bless, we just say it so, um, it's in a shallow way. But to bless means You ask God to give the person everything for their well-being. Everything that makes for well-being, being being well, a blessing. Food, clothing, shelter. In those days, uh, financial security. How many want that blessing? (laughs) Right? Uh, And keep you. That means to guard and to guide. I have it on, on your handout there. Protection and guidance. Because when you pray it, you've got to know what you're praying for. Right? Just not just, may the Lord bless you and keep you. <laughs> but just even that word, may the Lord bless you. I want all good things for, I'll pretend my niece is Julie, all good things for her. And then I want God to guide, guide her, to make a new direction. That's what guidance is, yes? Direction and guard. Protect from evil because the situation that she's in is, is, is a, could be harmful to her. So I ask God to guide and direct. That's under keep. Only God, it's the word for God's keeping. All right? May the Lord let his face shine upon you. Face shine upon is a way of saying it's their imaging for smile. I want God to smile on her. Now, most of the time I pray and I think, oh, Lord God, judge this. <laughs> All right, but now I'm saying I want God to smile upon them. Are you following? All right, that's reframing a little bit here. And be what? Gracious, welcoming, grazia, give her all good gifts. May the Lord look upon you what? Kindly, as kin, as his child. As his child, I'm God's child, and so is Julie, God's child. Look upon her as kin, kindly, and give you peace. And peace is shalom, and give them peace. Usually I'm praying for my peace. And shalom. And if you have shalom, then you have blessing. So it's kind of like a sandwich. May the Lord bless you and give you peace. Peace. And so we want shalominess. Isn't that a beautiful word? I made it up. <laughs> Shalomi. Um, in the Psalms, if things aren't good, the psalmist says, I'm in Sheol. Sheol. I'm in the pits. All right, a not good day. That's another thing you could surprise people with when they say, How are you doing today? And say, Sheoli. <laughs> not so good. Not so good. But shalomi good things. And we want that for others. We want that for others. So shalom. So what are you going to do? What's your exercise? Are you okay? We have seven minutes. I'm okay. Yes? We'll be just right. right. You begin this exercise. 
all right, and with, with beads, 10, 7, 5, and you begin by specifically naming people, all right, and you begin on a reasonable scale until you get into the habit of this attitude in your mind and your heart. So you begin, right now you can just think of two people who just upset your life in some way. You know, they annoy or irritate you. No biggie, but we have somebody on our faculty that always breaks the duplicating machine. <laughs> well, that annoys and irritates, yes? So if I see them walk in before me, Then instead of the usual thinking of, oh, that, mm, <laughs> I say, in my head, may the Lord bless you. Are you with me? All right, so you practice this on a reasonable scale. Think of someone that annoys you that usually that you meet all the time, the postmaster, the bus driver, somebody that you meet all the time, annoys, okay? Then think of two people that you think are dangerous, a threat to the world, or to the church. So I will in public say I, I pray f- under this one for Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> okay. I pray for her. All right. I pray for, I used to pray for Britney Spears. I pray for, uh, so it can be any public leader, movie star, author, because they need God's blessing. Instead of horrible thoughts. Are you following? Yes. And you start with them. You start, so you get in the habit of saying, may the Lord bless you and keep you, Nancy. May the Lord let his face shine upon you, Nancy, and be gracious to you, Nancy. May the Lord look upon you kindly, Nancy, and give you peace. (laughs) All right, so I'm asking God, are you following this? And then if Nancy never changes, that's God's problem. (laughs) But I'm not, you got it, I can tell, you got it. So... You don't advise God to change them. You just ask God to bless them, all right? And you get in the habit. You can also pray this, of course, for those you love. You know, because some of the sisters found out I was talking about this and praying it, and they said, I hope you don't pray it for me. (laughs) (laughs) But it's easy to pray it for my mom, my brothers. Uh, You know, may the Lord bless you and keep you, David. And and it's beautiful. But it works for this, for an exercise for forgiveness. All right? Continue to pray. And then, uh, friends, and this is difficult, when you're ready, when you feel ready, uh, it's hard to put someone's name in and ask for the blessings when you're still in the midst of the hurt the resentment, the confusion, still saying, why did this happen? How could it happen? Uh, But when you're ready, ask God to help you. Grace, always his grace, to bless the person who's broken your heart that sinned against you or hurt you. You And for... Many people, the first time to say, may the Lord bless you and keep you, Pete, who's committed adultery. To put the name in, um, how many understand? That, that's a, it can be tricky. Um, so slowly, slowly, slowly. Because you're, you're doing what Christian love is. You're the effective willing of the good of the other. And hopefully God's blessing for them will be that they will see what's at work in their life, the grace to open up, to return to the church, to return to you, etc. Okay? So um, that's my practical for, like, something concrete. And if there's a piece of rope around or something, make, make little knots. And then you've got it. You know, I always have one in my pocket. Um, and it just it, it helps you to cultivate the habit, and it neutralizes the acid that's in you. It neutralizes it. And even if they don't change, you do. You do. And you, then you're like, what? be holy. Then you're different. You're different. Okay? And the last thing, I have three minutes, is 
um, to meditate on the cloud of witnesses. So I have some listed there. This could go forever and ever and ever. Um, The name of love in a wounded world is to see this at work in our wounded world. And so, you know, start a little shelf or a folder. And even now, print out some of the articles that came out of the Charleston situation. If there's a person, I have some there. John Paul II, his witness in visiting Ali Aja, who never apologized, never said he was sorry. First greeting to JP2 was, why aren't you dead? I'm a good shot. That's come out since um, Pope John Paul died. And you find that John Paul II even wrote a letter to Ali Aja that he never mailed. You know, so J- John Paul II had to make the journey. He didn't visit the man the week after it happened. It was a year and a half after. You with me? Right. So to look at lives, I have some there. Kim Foote, Corey Tenboom, Immaculate Illabagiza. Just to be in her presence is a grace. She's a walking smile. And after being imprisoned, seeing everyone slaughtered in her family, so it's good to to connect yourself with those mentors and models. You know, and just keep all the time, find new ones. And there's plenty out there. I call the net the world of cyber grace. All right, not cyberspace, cyber grace. So, you know, just put qu- or quotes on forgiveness so that you, uh, you're, you're feeding your mind and your heart with the name of love in, in this wounded world. Amen? Amen? I thank you for your kind attention because I had the longest talk. <laughs> so. You're welcome so much. Do you want to take a question? Oh, certainly. Maybe one or two questions? Yes. Could you say something about self-forgiveness? Ah, a little about self-forgiveness. Well, when you move into the arena, there you have some people have forgive God, forgiveness of God, and then um, most. I'm not a psychologist, but from what I've read. Forgiveness of self is even harder than to forgive another. So forgiveness of self is a very specific arena that um, needs usually more outside help because you can, you can even C.S. Lewis said, I believed in God's forgiveness, but to, forget, to accept it and to know that I am forgiven um, that's God's gift that comes at some point in time, and it's, fra- it, it's I, I don't know how to express it right, more fragile territory even than trying to forgive another. Am I making sense? Because uh, you're, the dialogue is with yourself, not the dialogue with the other who hurt you. And so um, priests will say that self-forgiveness is the hardest. That's the most difficult thing with women who've had abortions, and they, they go to Mass, they become lectors, they receive communion, they know God has forgiven them, but they'll still say deep inside, they have not lived up, they experience shame. And self-forgiveness is linked with shame. Guilt can be taken care of, atonement. But shame, because I failed myself, is a, is a, a more difficult arena. I, I really, I can't say more than that except that it, you know, on the list of forgiving, forgiving self is a higher level challenge than forgiving others because you're failing yourself. Make sense? Yeah. yeah so um, I, I am connected with many women who've had, they come to witness in classes and they'll always say that. They'll always say, I know God has forgiven me, but I still, I know I failed myself in some way. So, yes. In response to that, I think I love what Mother Angelica says, that if 
an insult to God to think that your sins are greater than his mercy. Yes, that's good. Right. Uh-huh. So, yeah, C.S. Lewis said something comparable, but still there's the issue inside. So, but to remember, you know, God's offering that to everyone, including you in that. Yes. Um, this picture of the little girl, that, that one is um, Ruby Bridges. And she's the little girl that was involved with integration back in the 60s. And um, she was the only little girl going to school. And Robert Coles, the great Harvard psychologist, saw her going in. And um, the guards were all there, the National Guard. People were screaming terrible things. And um, she would turn around, six years old, before she went into the little classroom. She was the only student. And she would smile, and her lips would be moving. So Robert Coles asked her, got connected, and said, Ruby, what are you saying there? And she looked up at Robert Coles, and she said, well, I'm, I'm talking to God. And Robert Coles said, and what are you saying, Ruby? And Ruby looked at him and said, well, I'm saying, oh, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You know, she's 45, 50 years old now. Uh, she still gives talks um, with Robert Coles um, and uh, little Ruby Bridges. He said he couldn't speak after that little girl, because he said she had wisdom and grace. So what a witness. What a wit Yes, a little girl. Mm -hmm. One more. Yes. Well, teacher, I'm to listen to you, and thank you for all you did. But my question is, and this might not be, be anything, but um, on your PowerPoint where it said, um, bless your enemies, you had like a Mahjong tile or a Chinese symbol. Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out the why you had that on there. Oh, what was? Oh, I thought it was a Hebrew. Hebrew. Was it Hebrew? It's Hebrew. I think, it's, I think it's Hebrew. Was it? And what did that? Was that Shalom? Uh, it, I can't remember, and I don't. I know. I just looked up forgiveness, ironic blessing, and it was probably the Hebrew. Hebrew. Yeah. And in class, it's so beautiful to listen to the Hebrew. Of, the, of that blessing, and the students can pick up shalom, shalom, yeah, so probably it was Hebrew. <laughs> You're welcome, thank, and thank you for listening. Thank you. <laughs>